You said that if we want to be truly alive, living, and making the best use of our time, we need to bend ourselves in humility. What does that mean? So it's always an interesting an interesting challenge to pull quotations out of context and have them stay meaningful, have them stay powerful, have them stay understandable. And it's it's a joy, it's a it's a challenge. So that particular quotation, I think, must have been pulled out of one of the, the talks that we were doing about humility in general and about the ego and about bending the ego. And there's a, a beautiful quotation that perhaps I said that night when the quote came, the night the quote came from, but perhaps not. And the quote is in Hindi, but I'll Give it in Hindi and then I'll give it in English as well. Because the Hindi, there's just something very, very catchy about it. And the Hindi quote says, Jukta to vohe, jisme jaan hoti hai. Akar to morde, ke pachan hota hai. And what it means in English is, the way that you know someone is alive is when they're able to bend. When we stop being able to bend, that's how you know that we are like a corpse. That that which doesn't bend is corpse-like. That which bends is alive. And so we need to bend. If we want to be alive, our choices have our ego, have our identity, have that fixed notion of self so rigid that, yeah, it might last a little while, as long as there's no storms, as long as there's no wind, as long as there's nothing that, that pushes us. But the minute that there's any bit of a storm in our life, any bit of wind in our life, any bit of turbulence in our life, that which is unbending, unyielding, doesn't last the storm. This is, it's the same teaching when we speak about the tree that's very, very tall and strong, but that when the wind comes, falls. Compared to, for example, the tree that's a little bit more able to bend, or even the blade of grass that seems so small, that seems so fragile, but actually at the end of the storm, it's the blade of grass that has stood. So there are different teachings from different cultures, different languages, different holy books, but the teaching is the same, which is, if you're in this for the long haul, if you really want to last, not just the sunny season, if you really want to keep going until you get, and it's not just physical, yes, with the tree and grass, it's physical. But for us, the journey, the journey is the journey of our own unfolding, the journey of our own awakening, the journey of getting closer and closer to the light not outside. It's not the light at the end of the tunnel light. It's not let me just get through this hell and eventually it'll be nice light. It's the light in ourselves. But ironically, you can only get there if you're prepared to face the darkness because the levels, the levels of the self 
tend to look something like this. We have our most outer superficial level in which most of us put on a happy face. That's the put on a show level. It's the, now, now we've got a term for it. Now you could call it the Facebook level. When we first started talking about it, there was no Facebook. But now, now we can say, ah, it's our social media identity. And everybody immediately understands what we mean. It's the days that are good. It's the nice sunsets. It's the beautiful meals. It's the happily smiling pictures, even when things aren't necessarily going so well. That's the most superficial level. Go a little bit beneath that. Okay, you get some darkness. That's where the depression, the anxiety, the sense of not being enough, the fear, all of that comes in that darkness. That sense of there's something wrong with me. That sense of my darkness is me. But if you keep going through that darkness, you actually get to another light. It's not the superficial light of look who I'm having lunch with, look how beautiful I am smiling here, you know, in my selfie. But it's a light that requires you to be prepared to go through the darkness. And if we're not prepared to look at that, if all we're able to do, if all we have the courage to do is stay on the most superficial level, it's all fine. I don't want to look at this. I don't want to talk about this. Don't trigger me. Don't challenge me. You know, we all, we all in the spiritual world know people like this. It's the, I have to surround myself only with really peaceful, nice people because I'm on a spiritual path. Well, no. The spiritual path is not supposed to be something that limits the places you can be or the people you can be with. Rather, it should be expanding that because your sense of inner peace grows and grows and grows so that regardless of where you are, you're able to stay connected to it. But on the surface, when we first enter it, what you find is this sense of, I can't be with you, you're too negative. I can't be with you because you're not spiritual. I can't be with you because you disturb my peace. I can't. We've got this whole list of reasons why we can't be with certain people, do certain things. I can't do that, it disturbs my peace. You've got to handle the dishes because, you know, the soap and the water and the mess and it really disrupts my peace and I'm committed to my peace. So that's, that's our most superficial level. I can only do nice, nice things with nice, nice people and, you know, your, your feedback on that didn't feel good to me, therefore I no longer can do this type of thing. You get that, you get that a lot. When we're on this surface level, our fear becomes if I go beneath that, if I don't keep it all nicey, nicey, PC, PC, I'm going to be face to face with darkness. Because we all know it's there inside of us. Close your eyes, try to meditate. This is what gets so many people jumping right up out of their meditation. It's, I don't want to see it. We don't always explain it that way because the ego is an incredible justifier, an incredible rationalizer. I've got way too much to do. It is self-indulgent to meditate. It'll come up with all sorts of excuses. Why I can't meditate. The coffee pot is left on. If I sit here, I'm going to burn the house down. I still haven't done this. I haven't done that. My knee, my back, my feng shui, the season, my stars, whatever it may be. Once my kids are married, once my kids 
get a job, then I'll meditate. We come up with all kinds of excuses. But really for many people, on a deeper level, what it is is sitting and closing my eyes when I can't be distracted actually brings me face to face with too much darkness inside myself. And I don't want to face that. And so to protect me from that, my ego is going to come up with all kinds of excuses that actually make me feel good about the fact that I'm not meditating. See, I'm not self-indulgent at all. See, instead of doing things that I want to do, like meditate, I'm making you breakfast. You better be grateful. So you see, the ego, the ego can do all this. But for a lot of us, it's really the anxiety that rises up within us when you sit to meditate, when you close your eyes. But here's what's beautiful. Through that darkness, is a light. Not a light that's superficial. Not a light that prevents you from being with certain people or doing certain things. But a light that is you. So wherever you go, it's there. A light that's not at the end of the tunnel, as in I have to get through my darkness. You don't actually have to wade through it. You simply have to have the courage to look at it and to be present with it. And as you do that, as you internally make space for it to be there, you drop into a place of light. But in order to do that, and this brings us back full circle to the idea of bending, in order to do that, you have to get yourself, this lowercase s self I talk about almost every night, that superficial layer self, out of the way. Because while that self is running the show, this very neatly crafted identity. It can't be pushed. Like if you can't bend, the ground better not shake. If you can't bend, there better not be any wind. And so you're gonna do whatever you need to do to keep the wind away, to keep the earthquakes away, to keep the turbulence away because you can't bend. So you're fine, as long as no one or anything touches you. But in order, as I said in the quote that the question referred to, in order to really live, we have to be able to bend. Because it's only that that permits us to say, OK, come on. Like this storm we just had, how gorgeous. Right? I mean, how gorgeous. The smell of the earth when it rains in India, for me, smells more beautiful than any perfume that you could purchase for any amount of money from any store anywhere in the universe. But in order to experience it, if I'm, if I'm afraid, if I've got, you know, wicked witch of the can't remember if it was West or East syndrome, that I'm going to melt in the rain. Well, I can't be in it. If what I'm worried about is my false tan or my false fairness, whatever it is I've applied with the cream, running off, or the makeup I've put on running off, I'm going to run away from the rain. Because it's going to literally undo me, undo the me I identify as, the makeup, the cream, the clothes. 
But if I'm connected to a deeper me, then yeah, it's windy sometimes. And yeah, your clothes get wet sometimes. And yeah, your face gets wet sometimes. And yeah, you drown and you're drenched sometimes. But that's what it's about. That's, that's where we experience life. And so when you bend, you're able to live. And the other pieces, when you bend, it creates space. The very first time that Puja Swamiji ever asked me to give satsang, I remember still so vividly. It was about 12, 13-ish years ago. We were sitting in his garden, and, and I did public speaking. It, I wasn't afraid of public speaking. I was already doing public speaking, but I was doing it in situations where I knew what the topic was. So it was a pilgrimage for the Encyclopedia of Hinduism. All right, I knew I was going to have to talk about the Encyclopedia of Hinduism, or at least about Hindu culture, about dharma, about values, about sanskaras, or whatever the topic might be at that event. But we were sitting in his, in his garden, and people would ask questions, like here. And that night, somebody asked a question about anger and forgiveness. And it was something that came up a lot. It was something that we had done books and articles on, and I mean, so much. And the question came, and he turns to me, and he says, Sadviji. It was the first time he had done that. Now, logically, that shouldn't have been a big deal. I had A, heard him speak on anger and forgiveness a lot. I had B, written a lot of articles on the topic. There were a lot of points that I had in my mind, but here's what happened. And I'm sharing it with you because it's for me a perfect illustration of the space that the ego occupies and the magic that's able to happen if you can get out of the way, even briefly. So he says, Sadviji, and my brain then starts to do what I've always done as an academic, which is I started to file index cards in my brain. Those of you who took exams or wrote papers before computers, we used to have index cards. And we'd study for exams with index cards. And you'd write papers. You'd organize your papers with index cards. So when I used to take exams, I would have hundreds of index cards. And I would test myself front, back, front, back. So my brain functions like that. And I, and I had index cards in my brain. And they start shuffling. Anger, forgiveness. OK. And I'm going to sort them in my brain in an order so that I can give a coherent answer, like you would write an article. The problem is that process takes a little bit of time. Not much time, but 15, 20 minutes. If he had said, all right, everybody, we're going to have a tea break when we come back. Sadviji is going to talk to you about anger and forgiveness. I could have done it. I could have easily sorted the index cards in that time. But there was no time. And as I tried to do it, my ego panicked. I couldn't sort them fast enough. I didn't know where to start. I didn't know what points. And anybody who's ever studied stress knows that the more stressed you become, the less you're able to function at anything. And so my stress starts rising. Because, oh my god, I've just been asked to do something. And that, too, in front of 50 people. By my guru, I've been put on the spot. I better perform, and I better perform well. And so now there's anxiety. And now I can't see anything on any of these index cards. Now they're blank. And I then had a moment, which is embarrassing to share, but I'm going to share it anyway in the interest of full disclosure. 
It's something kids do. But it was my initial instinctive response in that moment, which was, if I close my eyes tight enough, maybe they'll all go away. And I literally, I literally squeezed my eyes closed really tightly, thinking that I could just magically make this go away and I would open my eyes and they'd all be gone. And I opened my eyes and they're all staring at me. I then close my eyes, I start to reshuffle the index cards, nothing. And I'm panicking. The ego is panicking. I'm going to make a fool of myself. That's what it was. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let down my guru. I'm going to make a fool of myself. I'm so embarrassed. Why couldn't I just keep, you know, sitting here and looking pretty? Why did they make me have to do something? And, and my ego was really panicking. And I then had a moment, I had already been in India, you know, almost 10 years at that point. So I, I had some spiritual practice behind me, thankfully. And I had a moment in which I realized, all right, whatever the reason, this is clearly a teaching for you of humiliation this is clearly a teaching for you about your ego and what you can't do, and just admit it. So I'm sitting there, my eyes are closed, and I'm having this analysis in my mind in which I'm saying, okay, okay, Swamiji, okay, Guruji, I'm so sorry. I can't do this. And in my mind, I literally bow down at his feet, and I say, I'm so sorry. I don't have it in me. I cannot do this. I've let you down. You've expected something of me, wanted something of me, and I don't have it in me. And in my mind, I literally just lay at his feet for such a long time. And then in my mind, I sat back up. And I opened my eyes, fully prepared to just face my my humiliation, my lack of an ability to do what I was called upon to do. But I was at peace with it. I had gotten my ego out of the way. And in that moment, I opened my eyes. And the words just flowed. I don't even know who opened my mouth or why my mouth opened, but somehow just out of my mouth, the words flowed. I have no idea what I said, but that happens on a, I mean, that's, that's a regular occurrence. But afterwards, two very magical things happened. One was, everyone came up afterwards and said how deeply touched they were. And two, I realized that I had had, even while I was speaking, my eyes were open, I was speaking, I had had one of the deepest meditative experiences of my life. That in getting out of the way, it created so much space in literally bending at the feet of my guru with a body and a mind saying, not me. I don't have it. I'm not it. I can't do it. It created so much space. And you know, physics tells us the universe hates a vacuum. And so into that space flowed so much grace that I, inside, in my own experience, was so touched by it that it, was, it, it felt better than closing my eyes in meditation almost. And B, whatever it was flowed not just into me but through me and had an intelligence, not my intelligence, but its intelligence 
which knew exactly what needed to be said in order to answer and to touch the people who were sitting there. And that, for me, has been what it's been about for the last, you know, as I said, probably close to 15 years. It's all about getting out of the way. And so I don't know what part of that I had spoken on the night that the quote was taken from about bending so we can live. But that's why we need to bend so we can live. Pooja Swamiji says the reason that we bow in our temples, the reason we bow at the feet of the deities, the reason we bow at the feet of our parents, that we bow at the feet of our gurus, the reason we keep bowing is to keep the spine limber. Not physically, but internally. That we keep bowing, keep bowing to remember how to keep bending, how to keep bending, to keep us in the habit of bending. Because when you bend physically, something inside you is triggered of that humility. And then that becomes your nature. So it's not just the physical spine that stays healthy, it's the, the internal spine. And so then, even, even while we still have life in our physical body, we make sure that we're really living and that we're not just a breathing corpse that's stubborn and strong. And that There's not a great English word for uckered, but it's that, that stubbornness of self. So we get free of that. So there's really life in us. <laughs>